21-year-old, blonde-haired Valerie Jean Percy, was a great asset to her father's election campaign. Charles Harding Percy, 47, had worked his way up from near poverty to become a millionaire. He had risen from a $12 a week job as a clerk to become president of camera manufacturer Bell & Howell Company at the age of 29 and a millionaire at 40. He resigned as chairman of the board to devote himself full-time to running for the U.S. Senate. A Republican, he was trying to unseat Illinois Democratic Senator Paul H. Douglas, 74. Percy had previously made an unsuccessful bid to defeat Illinois Governor Otto Kerner in 1964. The November 8, 1966 race for the Senate was tight. Senator Douglas had served three terms and was Percy's former economics professor, 25 years earlier at the University of Chicago, but Percy was determined to make a run for the job, and his daughter was helping with his campaign. She had graduated from the Ivy League Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, the previous June with a bachelor's degree, majoring in French literature. She had spent her, her junior year in Paris and planned to enter Johns Hopkins University in the fall for a Master of Arts in Teaching, for which she had received a scholarship. The modest and unassuming young woman was a good student. While at Cornell, she had been a member of the Kappa Kappa Gamma sorority and participated in several student organizations. They included the Student Government's Academic Affairs Committee and the International Committee of the Student Union's Willard Strait Hall. She regularly dated Andrew Potash, senior class president, during her final year. He worked for her father during the summer, and the New York City native was planning to study at the London School of Economics in the fall. Valerie Percy came home for the summer to work on her father's campaign, and she was an effective worker at his Chicago headquarters. She set up 22 campaign centers in the area, recruited hundreds of young volunteers, and made speeches for Chuck Percy. Valerie is my best precinct worker, he told a rally of campaign workers on September 17, 1966. Meanwhile, Valerie and stepmother Lorraine were entertaining key campaign workers, Calvin Fentress and Tully Friedman, at the family's home in the suburb of Kenilworth. The Percys lived in a 17-room, Tudor-style mansion called Windward that sat on a three-acre lakefront estate on Lake Michigan. Fentress had been a full-time member of Percy's staff since the aspiring senator's gubernatorial bid in 1964, while Friedman was the director of the campaign's neighborhood headquarters program. Over dinner, they discussed how they could appeal to young voters. The two campaign workers left at about 10 p.m. Valerie went up to her room, changed into her pajamas, and sat up in bed to watch television. Twin sister Sharon returned home from a date at about 11.30 p.m., and she went to Valerie's room to return a raincoat that she had borrowed. After his campaign appearance in Chicago, Chuck Percy returned to his $230,000 state at about midnight. Valerie and Sharon were each in their bedrooms, just down the hall from the master bedroom. Younger daughter Gail, 13, was asleep. Son Roger, 19, was away at university, and Mark, 11, was staying over at a friend's house. Charles and wife Lorraine Percy, 37, watched television for about an hour before going to sleep at about 1.30 a.m. Lorraine was half asleep just before dawn, less than four hours later, on September 18, 1966, when she heard the sound of breaking glass. Then she heard a clicking sound as though someone with hard heels were walking across a tile floor. Thinking that perhaps one of the Percy daughters had knocked a water glass off their nightstand, she went back to sleep. Moments later, Lorraine awakened to the sound of someone moaning. She quietly climbed out of bed and walked down the hall. Keeping an ear cocked, she realized that the sound was coming from Valerie's room. When she opened the door, she saw the figure of a man bent over her stepdaughter's blood-soaked bed. She gasped. The intruder, who was shining his light on Valerie's body, turned and beamed the flashlight into Lorraine's eyes. Momentarily blinded, she took a step back. The dark-haired man was wearing a checkered shirt, stood about 5 feet 8 inches tall, and weighed about 160 pounds. Then Lorraine turned and ran back to her bedroom and pressed the central burglar alarm button that activated a siren on the roof of the house at 5.05 a.m. Her screams woke her husband. 
Meanwhile, the killer fled down the stairs and ran out through the French doors leading from the music room to the patio. The family Labrador retriever Li Fu, Chinese for guardian, did not bark at the intruder. With so many campaign workers coming in and out of the house, the dog had learned to ignore everyone but men in uniforms. When Chuck Percy reached his daughter's room seconds later, he turned on the light and realized that she was near death. She had been hit on the head twice and repeatedly stabbed in the face, chest, and stomach ten times. Lorraine Percy felt a faint pulse and used a pillowcase to carefully dab blood from Valerie's face. Her husband phoned neighbor Dr. Robert Hof, a surgeon who worked at Evanston Hospital, to come and examine Valerie. Hof pulled on a pair of pants over his pajamas and raced to the Percy home. He rushed up the circular staircase to the second floor and entered Valerie's bedroom at about 5.10 a.m. She was lying across the blood-stained covers of her bed. The young woman had been stabbed in the face six times, once in the neck, twice in the chest, and twice in the stomach. Blows to the head with a heavy object had left four cone-shaped puncture wounds in her skull. Hof walked back downstairs to the living room where Chuck, Lorraine, Sharon, and Gail were assembled and delivered the bad news to her family. There was nothing he could do. Valerie was dead. By then, Kenilworth Police Chief Robert H. Daly was on his way to the Percy Estate with a few crime laboratory technicians from Chicago, Chicago Police Homicide Sergeant James Moore and Detective Hartwell McGuinn. Cook County Coroner Andrew J. Toman and his assistant Sidney Berman also arrived. This was the first homicide in Kenilworth's 75-year history since Chicago businessman Joseph Sears founded the suburb in the early 1890s. Daly had contacted Chicago Police Superintendent Orlando W. Wilson for help with the investigation in this community of nearly 2,800 people. Daly and his 11 men also received assistance throughout the investigation from the Cook County State's Attorney investigators under the direction of Lieutenant Nicholas Jurek, six Illinois State Police detectives commanded by Lieutenant Richard Robb, Sheriff's deputies, and FBI agents. Police discovered that the intruder had come through a flagstone patio, cut out a four-inch square section from a screen door, and used glass cutters to remove a piece of pane from the glass of a French door that stood between the music room and the patio. The person then reached through the opening to unlock the door and entered the house. He walked across the tiled floor of the music room and climbed the 18 steps of the staircase to Valerie's room on the second floor. Detectives did not understand the motive for the killing. The intruder had not stolen any money, jewelry, or other valuables from the victim's room. Police questioned family members, friends, the maid, and Liven Butler, but nobody could think of anyone who would want to harm Valerie. Police found fingerprints on the pane of glass and the French door. Experts at the Chicago Police Crime Laboratory said that three prints were found on two pieces of glass that had been removed from the door. Only one print was clear enough to be useful, however, and it did not match those of any family members or people who came to the house. Police also found five bloody palm prints left on the banister as the killer fled down the stairs and out of the house. A funeral service for Valerie Percy was held on September 20, 1966, at Kenilworth Union Church. The Percys were devout Christian scientists and funeral services are not usually held in churches. However, her father wanted a place to accommodate a large number of mourners. Some 400 people came to pay their respects. Pink roses, Valerie's favorite flowers, decorated the oak altar. This was the family's second tragedy. Valerie's mother, Jean died in 1947 after a violent reaction to drugs, following an apparently simple and successful operation. Percy married the former Lorraine Gaillet in 1950. Mr. and Mrs. Percy, Valerie's twin sister, Sharon, her younger sister, Gail, 12, brothers Roger, 19, and Mark, 11, sat through the memorial service. Also in attendance was former classmate and boyfriend Andrew Potash, 21. He had flown home from the University of Sussex in England the night before. After the memorial service, the family drove to the graveyard of Christ Episcopal Church in Winnetka, where Valerie's ashes were buried. The Percy family fled their Kenilworth home the following day and slipped away from Chicago into seclusion. 
Campaign manager Thomas J. Hauser announced that all Percy campaign offices would stay closed until further notice. When he received news of the murder of his opponent's daughter, Senator Douglas sent him a message that read, My heart goes out to you over your cruel and terrible loss. I am calling off all campaigning. Percy responded, saying, It is impossible for me to say at this time when I will be able to resume my own candidacy. Whenever you resume your campaign, I will understand completely. The election campaign was halted, but the police investigation continued. Police believe that the killer wanted to rid himself of the murder weapons as soon as possible and may have tossed them into nearby Lake Michigan. They hope to find the glass cutter, the object the killer used to hit Valerie in the head, and the weapon used to stab her. Scuba divers with the Coast Guard dressed in rubber suits and combed the lake sandy bottom off the Percy family's private beach. They used an improvised dragnet that consisted of a heavy iron bar five feet long with six magnets attached like studs. The bar was attached to sturdy lines and dragged along the bottom of the lake. The men swept the beach for nearly four hours, widening a few steps, pulling up the bar to check it, and returning it to the bottom of the lake. Chief Boatswain's mate Leo Gross said that he found a hot spot about 35 feet from the shore in about four feet of water. The drag line registered an object at the sandy bottom of the lake, but magnets couldn't grab and retrieve it. A diver would go underwater to retrieve the object, which would be displaced several feet from the spot by turbulent waves. Severe squalls made it impossible for them to bring the object to the surface. The Coast Guard was eventually able to retrieve an old army bayonet from the water, but there was no indication whether it had been used to stab the victim. Police were following other leads as well. The morning of the murder, investigators had found the footprints of bare feet leading between the Percy home and the family's private beach on Lake Michigan. This led them to believe that the murderer had fled towards the beach. Neighbor Nidia Hof, who lived just south of the Percy house, had been awakened by the siren wailing from the roof of the Percy home at 5.05 a.m., just after the murder occurred. She grabbed her robe and ran into her backyard. From her view of the south side of the Percy home and their private beach, she didn't see anyone. A cab driver told police that he said he saw a green station wagon coming from Devonshire Lane just after the siren from the Percy home sounded. The Percys lived at 40 Devonshire Lane, a street that was only about a block long. Detectives located the driver and cleared him of suspicion. It turned out that he had merely used the family's driveway at 5.30 a.m. to turn around. Police focused their investigation on people who were familiar with the Percy family home. They included three campaign workers, one of whom was dismissed that summer for drinking. The others were barred from further visits to the house, but the reasons were not disclosed publicly. Detectives interviewed scores of people who were familiar with the house's layout, but no viable suspects turned up. An address book that they found in Valerie's bedroom offered no new leads. Police also talked to every campaign worker and anyone who had applied to work on Charles Percy's campaign but were not accepted. No information that could help the investigation turned up. Two close friends of Valerie Percy, who had dined with her the night before her murder, agreed to take lie detector tests. Tully Friedman, 24, passed the polygraph test, while Calvin Fentress, through 28, was so nervous that his test results were inconclusive. Neither of them were considered suspects. Charles Percy returned home on the evening of October 4, 1966, to resume campaigning for a Senate seat after two weeks of seclusion in California. This is what I must do, and it is what my family wants me to do, he said at a news conference the following day, but he planned to do so at a more moderate pace, to spend time with his wife, Lorraine, daughters, Sharon and Gail, and two sons. He also thanked his opponent for acting generously, graciously, and with understanding since Valerie's murder. Senator Douglas announced that he would resume his campaign as well, since suspending it the day that Valerie Percy was found dead. By then, police had checked out more than 500 leads and questioned some 350 people. As the investigation began its fourth week, police still didn't have any significant leads to the murderer. 
Percy was elected to the U.S. Senate in November 1966. He sold the Kenilworth estate. Lorraine was too frightened to stay there. After moving to Washington, D.C., Percy offered a $50,000 reward for information leading to the arrest of his daughter's killer. But the money was never claimed. Eighteen months after the murder on March 18, 1968, Kenilworth Police Chief Edward Eggert ended the full-time investigation into the case. One state policeman would work part-time on it, with the help of one Kenilworth policeman, as needed. In the first two years after the murder, police interviewed some 10,000 people and investigated 1,226 suspects, including burglars, drug addicts, boyfriends, former boyfriends, employees, and campaign staff workers. Over the years, they also checked out the false confessions of 19 men, but none were linked to the murder. One confession included an 18-year-old Arizona man who told Tucson police that a stranger had paid him $75 to kill anyone in the Percy house. FBI agents concluded that the sailor was nowhere near the home at the time of the slaying. He sold the Kenilworth estate. In 1970, Harold James Jimmy Evans, 24, said that Frederick J. Freddy Malkow had confessed to killing Valerie Percy when the two men were cellmates in the Montgomery County, Pennsylvania jail. Malkow was a career thief who would commit burglaries and then hop on a plane to return home. At the time of the alleged confession, Malkow was in jail awaiting trial for rape and robbery in connection with a home invasion in Norristown. According to Evans, Malchow said that he flew from Texas to burglarize the Percy home, but Valerie woke up while he was in her room. He pushed her down on the bed with one hand and stabbed her with the other. By the time the story had surfaced, however, Malchow was dead. He had escaped from Norristown Jail in the spring of 1967 and plunged to his death from a railroad trestle over the Schuylkill River when police were about to recapture him. Seven years after the murder, another lead popped up. By then, Illinois State Police had interviewed more than 14,000 people, spent over $300,000, and painstakingly pursued 1,317 leads. This lead looked promising. A woman alleged that her former boyfriend, convicted burglar Francis Leroy Hohemer, 46, was the killer. Hohemer and Malchow were members of a gang of burglars that roamed coast to coast from 1965 to 1967, robbing the homes of the wealthy. Both men were believed to have violent dispositions. Hoheimer favored a propane blowtorch during his heists, which he used to enter homes and threaten reluctant robbery victims. Malchow was arrested numerous times on such charges as rape and assault. By 1973, Hohemer was serving a 30-year sentence at the Iowa State Penitentiary in Fort Madison. The day after the Percy murder, he reportedly told his brother Harold Wayne Hohemer that he got into some trouble during a break-in and had to kill someone. In 1972, crime syndicate member Leo Rubendorf, 58, had told two Chicago Sun-Times reporters that Hohemer had confessed to the killing. Robert Stanfield, 29, an acquaintance of Hohemer's, disclosed that Hohemer had informed him two weeks before the murder that he had cased the mansion and intended to rob the Percy's. When police questioned Hohemer, he said that he wasn't even at the scene of the murder. He initially blamed Norman Jackson, a member of his gang. Before Jackson could be questioned, however, he died mysteriously after plunging from a Chicago building. Then Hohemer claimed that it was Malchow, another member of his gang, and not Jackson, who killed Percy. He said that Malkow and gang members Evans and William Jackson came to his Chicago apartment for a change of clothes the day of the murder. Bohemer burned Malkow's bloody clothes. Illinois State Police agent Robert Lamb believed that Malchow was the killer and that he had acted alone. He committed his burglaries at night and was in Chicago at the time of the murder. However, four palm prints found at the Percy Mansion were not Hohemer's or Malchow's, and there was no physical evidence linking Percy's murder to Malchow or Hohemer. More than 40 years later, this murder remains unsolved. <laughs>